Hello folks, this is again Jörg Lissmann from YouTube channel Jockler66. Today I'm starting the reading on chapter 1 of the book Rulers of Evil from Tapper Saucy. Rulers of Evil has the undertitle Useful Knowledge About Governing Bodies. So when you want to know who really governs you, then you should really have a look at this book. But I think I made that already clear in my teaser video and the excerpt video and of course in the introduction that I read a few days ago, I think yesterday it was. Thank you also for the support and watching of this book reading. Now, chapter one is called Subliminal Rome and this Subliminal Rome starts with actually a drawing that Eftab Asasi made of the cover of Time magazine from February 1992. And that time cover magazine is called The Holy Alliance. Um, how Reagan and the Pope conspired to assist Poland's solidarity movement and hasten the demise of communism. The Roman Catholic Church is a state. And this is a quote from Bishop Mandel Creighton from his letters that he wrote. Now, Subliminal Rome starts as follows. When a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter announced in his 1992 Time magazine cover story that a conspiracy binding President Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II into a quote unquote secret holy alliance had brought about the demise of communism, at least one reader saw through the hype. Professor A. Carol A. Brown of the University of Massachusetts fired off a letter to Time's editors saying, quote, Last week, I taught my students about the separation of church and state. This week, I learned that the Pope is running U.S. foreign policy. No wonder our young people are cynical about American ideals." Unquote. What Brown had learned from Carl Bernstein, I had discovered for myself over several years of private investigation. The papacy really does run United States foreign policy and always has. Yes, Bernstein noted that the leading American players behind the Reagan-Vatican conspiracy to a man were quote-unquote devout Roman Catholics, namely, for example, we have William Casey as the director of CIA. You have Alexander Haig, who was Secretary of State at that time. Richard Allen, who was a National Security Advisor and also Judge William Clark, who was also a National Security Advisor. Further on, we found Vernon Walters, Ambassador at Large, and William Wilson, Ambassador to the Vatican State. Now, that's also something probably a lot of people do not know, that William Wilson was an Ambassador to the Vatican State because Ronald Reagan reinstalled the um, diplomatic relations with the Vatican recognizing the Vatican City as a state in itself in 1984, if I'm not mistaken, of the year. And you know, these uh, diplomatic relations were broken after the assassination of Lincoln, when the American people uh, learned the involvement of the Roman Catholic Church, or better, the Jesuits, into the involvement of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, and it was only restored in 1984 or something by Ronald Reagan. Just a little insert for me here. So continue reading. But the reporter neglected to mention that the entire Senate Foreign Relations Committee was governed by Roman Catholics as well. Specifically, we have here the senators following, and listen well, listen very close to the names now. Joseph Biden, from the Subcommittee on European Affairs. Who is Joseph Biden today, 2015? He is the Vice President behind the puppet Obama. Further on we have John Kerry and he is today in 2015 the Secretary of State under puppet President Obama. John Kerry was in that time Senator for Terrorism, Narcotics and International Communications. Further on we have Paul Sabanis, International Economic Policy, Trade, Oceans and Environment. Daniel P. Moynihan, Near Eastern and South Asian Affairs. And Christopher Dodd, 
for the Western Hemisphere and Peace Corps affairs. Bernstein would have been wandering off point to list the Roman Catholic leaders of American domestic policy, such as Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell and Speaker of the House Tom Foley. By the way, the Speaker of the House today in 2015 also is a devout Roman Catholic. Uh, Boner is his name, and he was the one who announced that Pope Francis I is coming this year in September 2015 over to the United States of America to speak in front of a joint session of Congress on behalf of the American people. So, this is quite a nice line that you can trace all through this special positions these people were in at that time and still are in. I mean, we are speaking here about more than 20 years ago and still, uh, 30 years ago and still you have Roman Catholics in that positions, of course. But you know, in fact, when the Holy Alliance story hit the stands, there was virtually no arena of federal legislative activity, according to the 1992 World Almanac of US politics, that was not directly controlled by a Roman Catholic senator or representative. 23 years ago, huh? The committees and subcommittees of the United States Senate and House of Representatives uh, governing commerce, communications and telecommunications, energy, medicine, health, education and welfare, human services, consumer protection, finance and financial institutions, transportation, uh, labor and unemployment, hazardous materials, taxation, bank regulation, currency and monetary policy, oversight of the Federal Reserve System, which you know is neither federal nor has it any reserves, commodity prices, rents services, small business administration, urban affairs, European affairs, Near Eastern and South Asian affairs, terrorism, narcotics, international communications, international economic trade, oceans, environmental policy, insurance, housing, community development, federal loan guarantees, economic stabilization measures, including wage and price controls, very interesting price controls, why do you have price controls when you have a free market? Huh? Gold and precious metals transactions, agriculture, animal and forestry industries, rural issues, nutrition, price supports, food for peace, agricultural exports, soil conservation, irrigation, stream channelization, flood control, minority enterprise, environment and pollution, appropriations, defense, foreign operations, vaccines, drug labeling and packaging, drug and alcohol abuse, inspection and certification of fish and processed food, use of vitamins and saccharin, national health insurance proposals, human services, legal services, family relations, the arts and humanities, the handicapped and aging. In other words, virtually every aspect of secular life in America came under the chairmanship of one of these, now listed in the list that I will just read to you, of these Roman Catholic laypersons. But think a little bit about what I've just read to you. Federal loan guarantees, insurance, housing, Gold and precious metal transactions. Well, I think this is something to think about, you know. When the dollar is going to collapse, which it will, because the Federal Reserve System will collapse, of course, because that's planned. And then they are maybe introducing a new currency based on gold, a gold-based currency, you have to ask yourself who is in control of all the gold and who has all the gold in the world right now? Well, the answer to the second question is the Vatican has all the gold right now. And here you see <coughs> excuse me, that 
all these things, like also the gold and precious metal transactions, are under chairmanship of a Roman Catholic layperson like the people that I will just read to you a name here in, the list, in this list. So, United States of America, so-called be, being a Protestant country, and everything that I've just read to you, defense, foreign operations, vaccine, processed food, vitamins, national health insurance, and so on and so on, everything I just read to you, is under the control of a Roman Catholic. How is that possible in a Protestant country, I ask you? But okay, I'm going to continue reading now with this list of the Roman Catholic laypersons who have the chairmanship and who were these people. They were Frank Annunzio, Edward Kennedy, Daniel Moynihan, Joseph Biden, John Kerry, John Murtha, Silvio Conti, John LaFalci, Mary Rose Oakar, Kika de la Garza, Patrick Leahy, David Obey, John Dingell, Charles Lucan, Claiborne Pell, Christopher Dodd, Edward Madigan, Charles Rangel, Vic Fezio, Edward Markey, Dan Rostenkowski, James Floria, Florio, Joseph McDade, Henry Gonzalez, Barbara Mikulski, Thomas Harkin, George Miller. And it was Dan Rostenkowski or Edward Roybel, one of the two that's listed here. Vatican Council II's Constitution of the Church from 1964 means that was uh, written during Vatican II, the council that found place between 1963 and 19, 1962 and 1965, instructs politicians to use their secular offices, their secular offices, to advance the cause of Roman Catholicism. So a secular office is advised to advance the cause of Roman Catholicism. Doesn't that smell like church and state melting together? Catholic laypersons, quote, whoever they are, are called upon to expend all their energy for the growth of the church and its continuous sanctification, unquote, and, quote, to make the church present and operative in those places and circumstances where only through them can it become the salt of the earth." Unquote. That's from paragraph 4, article 33 of the Constitution on the Church in 1964 from Vatican II. Vatican II further instructs all Catholics, quote, by their competence in secular disciplines and by their activity to vigorously contribute their efforts so that the goods of this world may be more equitably distributed among all men and may in their own way be conducive to universal progress in human and Christian freedom and to remedy the customs and conditions of the world if they are an inducement to sin so that they all may be conformed to the norms of justice and may favor the practice of virtue rather than hinder it. End quote. This was paragraph 5, or article 5, paragraph 36. Vatican II affirms Catholic doctrine dating back to 1302, 1302, when Pope Boniface VIII asserted that, listen closely, quote, It is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. Unquote. Pope Boniface VIII asserted this in 1302, 700, more than 700 years ago. It is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. This was the inspiration for the papacy to create the United States of America that materialized in 1776 by a process just as secret as the Reagan Vatican production of Eastern Europe in 1989. What? 
American government Roman Catholic from the beginning? Is, is that what you are just trying to tell me here? 1776, that was the founding of our Protestant nation, and the American government was Roman Catholic from the beginning? Well, yeah, you know, we are just on page, uh, I don't know, page four of the first chapter, but you will absolutely see that the longer we go in this book, that you will see that the founding of the United States of America was a Roman Catholic plan. And when you want to have more information on that, you can also go to <coughs> my YouTube channel, Joggler66, where we have for the moment the broadcasts on Hour of the Truth and are doing a reading of the booklet, me and Walt Stickle from GrandDesignExposed.com together, of the booklet The Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy. And there we deal explicitly with also something that Tapper Saucy will address right here and a little later in his book, go more deep into it, the role of the Carols, Daniel, John and Charles Carroll, three Roman Catholics, Jesuits by the way, and their hidden role as founding fathers, call no man father but he who is in heaven, I advise you, who were pursuing the Roman Catholic Church's agenda on founding the United States in 1776. So, the American government was Roman Catholic from the beginning? Consider, the land known today as the District of Columbia bore the name Rome in 1663 property records. And the branch of the Potomac River that bordered Rome on the south was called Tiber. This information was reported in the 1902 edition of the Catholic Encyclopedia's article on Daniel Carroll. So, let me just stop here for a second. What Tupper Saucy states here in his book is not a conspiracy theory, is not something that he just made out of the blue. This is Roman Catholic Encyclopedia stated itself. This is what I personally love about the Antichrist system. It gives so much information away of who the Antichrist is and what they really are, what the Roman Catholic Church really is, what the so-called Pontifex Maximus, the Pope, really is. They give that all away in their own writing and you can look that up. But of course, we are talking about here uh, of the information reported in the 1902 edition of the Catholic Encyclopedia on the article on Daniel Carroll. And you have to make sure to get these older editions because, and this is what I continue reading now, the article specifically declaring itself of interest to Catholics in the 1902 edition was deleted from the new Catholic Encyclopedia in 1967. Interesting. Just when Vatican II finished in 1965, they brought out a new Catholic Encyclopedia. That is how these governing bodies, the hidden hand, are steering history teaching because they delete the things from history that they do not want you to know. Other facts were reported in 1902 and also deleted from 1967. For example, when Congress met in Washington for the first time in November 1800, the only two really comfortable and imposing houses within the bounds of the city belonged to Roman Catholics. One was Washington's first mayor, Robert Brent. The other was Brent's brother-in-law, Notley Young. And Notley Young was a Jesuit priest. Daniel Carroll was a Roman Catholic congressman from Maryland who signed two of America's fundamental documents, the Articles of Confederation and the United States Constitution. Carroll was a direct descendant of the Calverts, a Catholic family to whom King Charles I of England had granted Maryland as a feudal barony. Carroll had received his education at St. Omer's Jesuit College in Flanders. That's, by the way, not so far from where I live, because I also live in Flanders. Where young English-speaking Catholics 
were trained in a variety of guerrilla techniques for advancing the cause of Roman Catholicism among hostile Protestants. In 1790, President George Washington, a Protestant, well, here I have to make a little stop because I do not agree that uh, we can call George Washington a Protestant, and I think Tapa Saucy knows this as well. Um, when you go to the capital of the United States in Washington and you look up to the ceiling, there is a big painting over there that is called the Apotheotis. And in this Apotheotis, George Washington is deified next to, I think, um, a little bit more than ten different pagan goddesses like Ceres and Diana and I don't know um, there's another video I spoke about all these but you can look that up for yourself just google the apotheosis in the capital in Washington and um, a protestant would have never been deified because that is blasphemy isn't it but anyway in 1790 George Washington appointed congressman Carroll to head a commission of three men to select land for the federal city, called for in the Constitution. Of all places, the Commission chose Rome, which at the time consisted of four farms, one of which belonged to Daniel Carroll. It was upon Carroll's farm that the new government chose to erect its most important building, the Capitol. The American capital abounds with clues of its Roman origins. Freedom, the Roman goddess whose statue crowns the dome, was created in Rome at the studio of American sculptor Thomas Crawford. We find a whole pantheon of Rome, Roman deities in the great fresco covering the dome's interior rotunda. Well, that's exactly what I just told you a few minutes ago. And who were these Roman deities? Persephone, Cirrus, Freedom, Vulcan, Mercury, even a deified George Washington, like I told you. These figures were the creation of Vatican artist Constantino Brumidi. The fact that the National State House evolved as a capital bespeaks Roman influence. No building can rightly be called a capital unless it's a temple of Jupiter the great father god of Rome, who ruled heaven with his thunderbolts and nourished the earth with his fertilizing rains. It was a Capitolium. It belonged to Jupiter and his priests. Now, let me just insert this. When you go to the Vatican today, St. Peter's Cathedral, it is exactly the same thing. It also is a temple of Jupiter and when you go in there and you have the so-called statue of Peter in there, that is not Peter, but that is just named Peter. That is a statue of Jupiter. Anyway, Jupiter's mascot was the eagle, which the founding fathers made their mascot as well. I think that now still on is the time that you will see something of Revelation 13. <coughs> the image of the beast, right? Take the capital, take St. Peter's Dome, now you have even the eagle that uh, Jupiter's mascot was and which the founding fathers also made their mascot. A Roman eagle tops the governing idol of the House of Representatives. A 46-inch sterling silver and ebony went walled a maze called a maze. The maze is the quote-unquote the symbol of authority in the house. When the sergeant-at-arms displays it before an unruly member of Congress, the maze restores order. Its position at the rostrum tells whether the house is in committee or in session. America's national motto, Anuit Captus, came from a prayer to Jupiter. Isn't that what is stated on your one dollar bill? Anuit Captus, Novus Ordo Seclorum? It appears in Book 9 of Virgil's epic propaganda, The Aeneid, a poem commissioned just before the birth of Christ by Seius Maxenas, the multi-billionaire power behind Augustus Caesar. 
The poem's objective was to fashion Rome into an imperial monarchy for which its citizens would gladly sacrifice their lives. Fascism may be an ugly word to many, but its stately emblem is apparently offensive to no one. The emblem of fascism, a pair of them, commands the wall above and behind the speaker's rostrum in the chamber of the House of Representatives. And I will put a photograph of that in the video that I make of this reading. They are called fascists, and I can think of no reason for them to be there other than to declare the fascistic nature of American Republican democracy. A fascist is a Roman device. Actually, it originated within the ancient Etruscans, from whom the earliest Romans derived their religious jurisprudence nearly 3,000 years ago. It's an axe head whose handle is a bundle of rods tightly strapped together by a red sinew. It symbolizes the ordering of priestly functions into a single infallible sovereign, an autocrat who could require life and limb of his subjects. If the fascist is entwined with a laurel, like the pair on the house wall, it signifies Caesarian military power. The Romans called this infallible sovereign Pontifex Maximus, or Supreme Bridge Builder. No Roman was called Pontifex Maximus until the title was given to Julius Caesar in 48 BC. Today's Pontifex Maximus is Pope John Paul II at the time of the writing this book, of course, because nothing has changed except the name we have now. Jorge Borgoglio, Pope Francis I, and his title also is Pontifex Maximus. Well, I think something that you have to uh, think about is that the fascists symbolize the ordering of priestly functions into a single infallible sovereign. Doesn't the Pope claim to be infallible? Isn't he a sovereign, the king of the kings, of the world? Isn't that his title? And when these fascists, a Roman fascist symbol, are put out in the House of Representatives, what do you think or who do you think rules that country? Okay, reading on. As we shall discover in a forthcoming chapter, because I don't want to jump ahead here, <laughs> John Paul II does not hold the title alone. He shares it with a mysterious partner, a military man, a man holding an office that has been known for more than four centuries as Papa Nero, the Black Pope. I shall present evidence that the House fascists represent the Black Pope who indeed rules the world. Later, I will, deliver, I will develop what is sure to become a controversial hypothesis, that the Black Pope rules by divine appointment and for the ultimate good of mankind. Well, whatever you consider to be good. And this was already the first chapter of Rulers of Evil. I will directly continue with chapter 2. And this chapter 2 is called Missionary Adaption. Few people seem to be aware that the Roman Catholic Church in America is officially recognized as a state. How this came about makes interesting reading. Early in its administration, President Ronald Reagan invited the, Vet uh, the Vatican City, whose ruling head is the Pope, to open its first embassy in Washington, D.C., his Holiness responded positively, and the embassy, or Apostolic Nunciature, of the Holy See, opened officially on January 10, 1984. So I'm sorry, I spoiled that a little bit by taking that um, a little bit away in the beginning of the reading, but um, here it comes, and you have the confirmation of that. It was in 1984 that the diplomatic relations between the Vatican and the United States of America were reinstalled. Shortly thereafter, 
A complaint was filed against President Reagan at U.S. District Court in Philadelphia by the American Jewish Congress, the Baptist Joint Committee on Public Affairs, Seventh-day Adventist, the National Council of Churches, the National Association of Evangelicals, and American United for Separation of Church and State. The plaintiff sought to have the court declare that the administration had unconstitutionally granted to the Roman Catholic faith privileges that were being denied to other establishments of religion. Now on May 7, 1985, the suit was thrown out by Chief Judge John Fallon. Judge Fallon ruled that district courts do not have jurisdiction to intervene in foreign policy decisions of the executive branch. Bishop James W. Malone, president of the U.S. Catholic Conference, praised Judge Fallon's decision, noting that it settled, quote, not a religious issue, but a public policy question, unquote. The plaintiffs appealed. The Third Circuit denied the appeal, noticing that, quote, the Roman Catholic Church's unique position of control over a sovereign territory gives it advantages that other religious organizations do not enjoy, unquote. The apostolic nunciature that 3339 Massachusetts Avenue, NW, enables Pontifex Maximus to supervise more closely American civil government, public policy, as administered through Roman Catholic laypersons. One such layperson was, was Chief Judge Fallum, whose Roman Catholicism apparently escaped the attention of the plaintiffs. Yeah, when you don't look for it, you cannot find something like that, right? This same imperium ran pagan Rome in essentially the same way. The public servants were priests of the various gods and goddesses. Monetary affairs, for example, were governed by priests of the goddess Monita, where you got your word money from. Priests of Dionysus managed architecture and cemeteries, while priests of Judicia, with her sword, and Libera, blindfolded, holding her scales aloft, ruled the courts. Hundreds of priestly orders, known as the Sacred College, managed hundreds of government bureau bureaus, from the justice system to the construction, the cleaning and repair of bridges, and no bridge could be built without the approval of Pontifex Maximus, which stands for Supreme or uh, uh, Bridge Builder, I mean... Uh, Pontifex Maximus, yeah, I, I forgot about that. Uh, okay. <clears throat> the Pope, actually. Buildings, temples, castles, bars, sewers, ports, highways, walls, and ramparts of cities and the boundaries of lands. Now, when you go today into a court, then you will see outside, of course, Justicia, with her sword and Libera blindfolded holding the scales. Did you know that these were Roman goddesses? And what do Roman goddesses have to do in any protestant country, in a court where you go and you think that you will get justice? What justice do you get from a Roman pagan system? What justice can you expect from Babylon? Priests directed the pave paving and repairing of streets and roads, supervised the calendar and the education of youth. Priests regulated weights, measures and the value of money. Priests solemnized and certified at birth, baptisms, puberty, purification, confession, adolescence, marriage, divorce, death, burial, excommunication, canonization, deification, adoption into families, adoption into tribes and orders of nobility. Priests ran the libraries um, the museums, the consecrated lands and treasures. Priests registered the trademarks and symbols. Priests were in charge of public worship, directing the festivals, plays, entertainments, games and ceremonies. Priests wrote and held custody over wills, testaments and legal conveyances. By the 4th century, 
one half of the lands and one fourth of the population of the Roman Empire were owned by the priests. When the Emperor Constantine and his Senate formally adopted Christianity as the Empire's official religion, the exercise was more of a merger or acquisition than a revolution. The wealth of the priests merely became the immediate possessions of the Christian churches, and the priests merely declared themselves Christians. Government continued without interruption. The pagan gods and goddesses were artfully outfitted with names appropriate to Christianity. The sign over the pantheon indicating to the fertility goddess Cybele and all the gods was rewritten to, quote, to Mary and all the saints, unquote. The temple of Apollo became the church of St. Apollinaris. The temple of Mars was reconsecrated church of Santa Martina, with the inscription Mars hence ejected, Martina martyred maid claims now the worship which to him was paid. Now there follows a very interesting extra information that I'm just going to looking up for you right now. These are actually two very interesting quotes that fall right into the subject that we are just talking about. And the first quote comes from A.C. Flick, from his book The Rise of the Medieval Church, 1909 edition, page 148. Quote, The mighty Catholic Church was little more than the Roman Empire baptized. Unquote. And the second quote, taken from Stanley's History, page 4. Quote, the popes filled the place of the vacant emperors at Rome, inheriting their power, their prestige, and their titles from paganism. So, you see, the Roman, em the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, the mighty Catholic Church, was little more than the Roman Empire baptized. And there is lots and lots of evidence for this. And you can find that in numerous books, and of course, also Tapasorsi wrote about this, in this wonderful book, Rulers of Evil. You can get the download link of the book and download it for free as a PDF and this uh, download link is presented to you in the description box of the video. So please go there, download that book for yourself and of course you can also follow my reading when you have the PDF up there. Continue reading now. Hallowed icons of Apollo were identified as Jesus and the crosses of Bacchus and Tammuz were accepted as the official symbol of the crucifixion. Pope Leo I decreed that, quote, St. Peter and St. Paul have replaced Romulus and Remus as Rome's protecting patrons, end quote. Pagan feasts, too, were Christianized. December 25th, the celebrated birthday of a number of gods, among them Saturn, Jupiter, Tammuz, Bacchus, Osiris, and Mithras was claimed to have been that of Jesus as well. And the traditional Saturnalia, season of drunken merriment and gift-giving, evolved into Christmas. Gift-giving, yeah. Christmas today is nothing more than just spending money, you know. And that's what they all want to do to you. And there's a interesting upload of 15 minutes on my YouTube channel, Jockler66, called All I Want for Christmas is the Truth About Christmas. And you can have a little look in that also to further study into that what um, Tapa Saucy writes here in this book. Continue reading now. Bacchus was popular in ancient France under his Greek name Dion, uh, Dionysus, or as the French rendered it, Denis. Denise. His feast, the Festum Dionysi, was held every seventh day of October, at the end of the vintage season. After two days of wild partying, another feast was held, the Festum Dionysi Eleutriere Rusticum, or meaning the country festival of Mary Dionysus. The papacy cleverly thought the worshippers of Dionysus into its jurisdiction by transforming the words Dionysus, Bacchus, Eleutere, and Rusticum into a group of Christian martyrs. October 7th was entered on the liturgical calendar as the feast day of St. Bacchus the Martyr, 
while October 9th was instituted as Festival of St. Denis and of his companions St. Eleuthery and St. Rustic. The Catholic Almanac of 1992 sustains the fabrication by designating October 9th as the Feast Days of Denis, Bishop of Paris, and two companions identified by earlier writers as Rusticus, a priest, and Eleutherius, a deacon martyred near Paris. Denis is popularly regarded as the apostle and patron saint of France. Playing loose with truth and scripture in order to bring every human creature into subjection to the Roman pontiff, as stated by Boniface VIII in 1302, is a technique called missionary adaption. This is explained as, quote, the adjustment of the mission subject to the cultural requirements of the mission object, so that the papacy's needs will be brought as much as possible in accord with existing socially shared patterns of thought, evaluation and action, so as to avoid unnecessary and serious disorganization." Unquote. Rome has so seamlessly adapted its mission to, America, secu uh, to American secularism that we do not think of the United States as a Catholic system. Yet, the roasters of government rather decisively show this to be the case. By far the greatest challenge to missionary adaption has been scripture, that is, the Old and New Testaments, commonly known as the Holy Bible. Almost for as long as Rome has been the seat of Pontifex Maximus, there has been a curious enmity between the popes and the Bible, whose believers they are presumed to have. In the next chapter, we shall begin our examination of that enmity. But I will continue reading chapter 3, which is then called uh, Marginalizing the Bible. And there it gets really interesting, I can tell you. I will hold that for another part. We have read now Subliminal Rome, the first chapter, and in the second chapter we have read about the missionary adaption. And I think that there is something very interesting going on that you see. Subliminal Rome is because it is hidden from you, but only hidden in the mainstream media. It is told to you by every means of using their symbolism all over the world, all over the United States of America. Every government building has symbolisms on it where you can easily identify its origin from. That is Roman, that is pagan, and that is Babylonian. And that has absolutely nothing to do with Protestantism. That has absolutely nothing to do with the body of Christ which a protestant country claims to live under. Your country has been hijacked from the beginning, as F. Tapasorsi said, and I think the more we get into this book, the more that this is clear to you, that the lay people, the normal people on the streets, have been betrayed from the beginning. You thought that you were fighting about tea and taxes, and actually you were not. Washington DC was founded on a river that is now called Potomac, that was then called Tiber, of a city that was then called in 1663 Rome, and is now called Washington DC. Just think about these little things, try to get more educated in your own history. Because if you do not know your own history, what is the inheritance what you have? What kind of culture do you have? A lot of people here in Europe say, well, the Americans, they don't have any culture anyway. Well, that in, in, in a certain way, that is right. But we here in Europe do not have many culture anymore also, because our history has been taken away also. So, anyway, I'm stopping now the reading here, and you can also uh, listen to this on... Um, Walt Stickles Mystery Babylon News uh, Block Talk Radio because this is just sections of 45 minutes and you can enjoy that there or you can enjoy the video on Joggler 66 and I invite you also to get uh, into the description box of the video and check out 
all the other links that I put there for your own research, because that is very important. Never forget, don't believe me, do your own research, and the truth that you will find for yourself shall make you free. So, thank you very much for listening, thank you very much for watching, I look out for the second part of this to come, when I read part uh, chapter 3 of Rulers of Evil, and until then, thank you for listening and watching, God bless you, and bye-bye.